It's funny how powerful symbols are, right? The Eiffel Tower makes you think of Paris, the Statue of Liberty is New York, and the Trevi Fountain is Rome, of course. Just with one symbol, you can invoke multiple concepts and ideas. You probably know that symbols are omnipresent in mathematics, but did you know that they are also very important in statistics, especially probabilistic programming? Rest assured, I didn't really know either until I talked with Brendan Willard. Brendan is indeed a big proponent of relational programming and symbolic computation, and he often promotes their use in research and in industry. Actually, a few weeks after our recording, Brendan started spearheading the revival of Theano through the JAX backend that we're currently working on for the future version of PyMC3. As you guessed it, Brendan is a core developer of PyMC and also a contributor to Airflow and IPython, just to name a few. His interests revolve around the means and methods of mathematical modeling and its automation. In a nutshell, he is a patient statistician. He likes to use the language and logic of probability to quantify uncertainty and frame problems. After a bachelor's in physics and mathematics, Brendan got a master's degree in statistics from the University of Chicago. He's worked in different areas in his career, from finance, transportation and energy to startups, GovTech and academia. Brendan particularly loves projects where popular statistical libraries are inadequate, where sophisticated models must be combined in non-trivial ways, or when you have to deal with high dimensional and discrete processes. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 30, recorded July 23, 2020. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayesstats.com. That's learnbayesstats.com. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive Bayesian swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash learnbayesstats. Starting at 3 euros, you can get various benefits like the private MBS Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash learnbayesstats. Thanks a lot, folks. I'm very grateful for any support you can bring me. Let me show you how to be a good busy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen. Maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming. How would I know unless I'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo control? science like I'm Richard Feynman is it because of my looks or the fact that I talk like a mad for books either way Brendan Willard welcome to learning Bayesian statistics hello thanks for having me I'm really happy to have you on the show thanks for taking the time I have the feeling that this episode will be highly symbolic <laughs> symbolic in the math computer science sense yes yeah yeah <laughs> we'll try we'll try but before talking about all that symbolic computation stuff, let's start by your background, as I usually do with the guests. So I'm curious, what is your story and how did you come into the data and programming world? So, well, programming world is pretty easy. Like most folks my age, I suppose, born in the 80s. I had a computer growing up, really old ones, got really into that. My father's really close friend was from California back in the days of like early homebrew computer electronic stuff. He's the guy that really got me into it and set me up more from the electronics end, but eventually programming. And I had, you know, a hand-me-down Commodore I had found, Commodore 64. And so this was when I was, I don't know, maybe 10, a little younger. So I've been programming ever since then. I've, obviously, when I came to around middle school or so, I got into like C and or advanced languages. I wanted to program video games like everyone else. It's a motivating factor for majority of kids. And I started working as a professional developer out of high school. And I actually didn't think I wanted to go to college, which isn't really realistic nowadays or even then. <laughs> but, yeah. So I figured, you know, I'll just kind of take computer science or something and just get a degree and keep working while I did that. 
But instead, for some odd reason, I got into physics. I can't really explain how that happened, but it did. And I saw I did physics, but I did it with a math bend. So I just took a lot of math, took much physics, and I went to Germany. I studied Munich through um, an exchange kind of program, but an extended one. It was like a little over a year or so in terms of like credit-wise semesters. I just kind of got into, what do you call it, high-energy physics. I went to Cornell in the summers to do high energy physics there, which was all statistics work. I'm sure you're aware that there are Bayesians in that sort of area. And that person I was working under, Giovanni Bonvincini, was a very Bayesian kind of guy. He got me into it. And then I was thinking about grad school, like most folks who've done physics. There are too many work options from there that are in physics. The next step is grad school. I don't know. I think something changed in my mindset and I realized Everything I would do in physics was essentially just statistics. So why not just study statistics? Yeah. That's the story, really. And I was at University of Chicago for grad school. And it was a great place to be for certain things. And I was in the stats department. That's what my degree was under. And I ended up gravitating towards the business school yeah. because the folks that were working there, professors, were very Bayesian. So there was Hedebert Lopez and Nicholas Polson, who kind of took me under their wing, in a sense and really got me into mathematical statistics. And we started publishing, or at least Nick has been a co-author of mine for the past few years. It's done a lot, you know, show me the ropes and kind of just be an overall mentor, so. Yeah, clearly. And that's funny, by the way, do you know why uh, most statisticians working in the business school at Chicago were using more Bayesian statistics? You know, from what I can tell, it's a cultural thing, right? I think some of the folks who had started there early in Booth and it's maybe it's history were a little more open to that. And they just kind of brought on other base folks. They kind of made a base community. Mm -hmm. There were quite a few people there that are pretty outstanding Bayesians. And, you know, those things come and go. But there was definitely a period where I would say there were at least a good handful of strong Bayesian thinkers there. And the other side of it is actually one I can relate to. I'm not sure if I can speak for everyone at Booth saying this, but as far as applied work goes, I was working in high-frequency trading, like a lot of people in Chicago, and time series were a big deal, right? I think the Bayesian approaches for like modeling sequential time series, particle filtering, especially for the much more complex models of those varieties, I think the Bayesians had a pretty good grasp on that. At least to me, it seemed easier to talk about those things and to develop on them. And that's really one of the things that got me into Bayesian statistics. I could kind of look at those problems and say, I could do anything with this. And you really needed to, especially for your particular trade. It almost never worked out that there was an out-of-the-box solution or anything like that, so to say. Things of that nature, just bigger picture estimations that are just point-wise are also extremely important. So yeah, all those come together and it happens to be Bayesian. Yeah, so basically it's because, if I understood correctly, the time series estimation and the uncertainty estimation were very important for this kind of work. So that's why they used particularly Bayes. And is it also the time where you were introduced to Bayesian statistics or were you introduced to them before that? Or did you happen to discover them at that time? Well, before that, it, like I was saying, in, in high energy physics is when I was introduced way in my undergrad. But at that point, I guess it was... I don't know. It, it was a different thing. I looked at it very differently. I didn't really have a full grasp of what the theoretical aspects were. And, you know, the whole thing about frequentist Bayesian, that didn't really land on me in any way. It didn't sink in. And yeah, it wasn't until a lot of time series, sequential modeling, that's really what I think made the picture of first non-Bayesian for me. It's enlightening. And actually, how often do you use these techniques today? Because, well, maybe let me ask you another question before that. What do you do today, by the way? You know, how does all your background you have been talking about fit into the work you're doing today? This year, at least, I guess you could say marketing, advertising of a certain variety. Yeah, it's still time series work. It's still very much the same type of work I've been doing all along. You know, custom models, obviously, is a big aspect of that. And by custom, I kind of also include the notion of an amount of flexibility in model definition that allows you to compute things in certain ways, you know, kind of allows you to more easily determine what's required to do these computations. And you know, it's saying that you can set up models that are more easy to parallelize, to run asynchronous certain ways. So yeah, that's basically it. Like a lot of hidden Markov models, you know, those dynamic linear models, a kind of Bayesian framework for time series, things like that. And a lot of stuff, and just like with my published work involving 
shrinkage priors, things of that nature. And then just your standard implementation. Obviously, a lot of the work, <laughs> perhaps the vast majority, is in implementation. Like defining models seems, seems to be a pretty small part of it. it. Well, there's a lot of back and forth, but not too much time spent going over that. Especially if you do things sort of bottom up in a way, which I don't know, I can't really say how often things are bottom up or top down. But if you're going bottom up and you're kind of starting with something as simple as possible and then extending it where needed, then yeah. I guess the day job part of it is, again, the time series, but the open source part of it, the, the uh, PyMC work, all that's, again, it's equally important. That's the implementation side. And it's obviously turned into all this symbolic stuff yeah. that I'm sure that I know a lot of the questions coming forward here <laughs> are, are going to be about. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. Did that answer your question? Do we have a... Yeah, completely. Completely answer my two questions, actually. So thanks for that. And yeah, yeah, actually, it's interesting because you're focused a lot on time series uh, work and models. And that's good because I didn't get to cover these types of models a lot in the show. And these are very interesting models, also very, very challenging models because sampling from that can be super complicated. We're going to talk about dynamically in our models a bit more during the show. I'm excited about that. Before that, though, I want to ask you a last maybe background question, which is something interesting in your background is that you started programming when you were 10 or something like that. So can you walk us through your programming journey and in particular, what your favorite programming language is these days? Uh, okay, programming at a young age, you know, started off pretty simple. Like I said, the, the person that got me into it did it from my kind of hardware side. So I would say that I started technically with something that would be more close to, I guess, like assembly-like. You'd have these chips. I always forget the kits. There were these kits you could buy and mm -hmm. program like microcontrollers or whatever and things like that. They were, they were very basic. Though. Anytime someone says something like assembly or whatever, it seems like, whoa, that's got to be complicated. But it's really not. It's actually dead simple. It's just, if you want to do complicated things, it's harder to express that or it's more, more painful to express that kind of stuff. But it depends. And then, of course, I learned QBasic with a PC at the time. Yeah, and then C. And the jump to C was actually kind of natural in a way. It involved programming video games. So I remember I was like, this was when I was maybe 12 or something. I had a neighbor down the block that was a few years older than me. And he was also into programming video games. And him and I kind of cobbled together QBasic stuff. And we tried to imitate all of our favorite games. So like Legend of Zelda or something, which is a you know top-down side-scroller kind of world. But you'd walk and then the screen would move as you walked, right? Yeah. Try yeah. to keep the, the character centered. But the graphics that we had programmed weren't efficient enough to update the screen as you walked. It was really slow. You could see the scan through the pixels as they were drawn. So at the time, this neighbor of mine was trying to work out ways to, to make it as smooth as possible. And I guess he was following what were the standard approaches of that time in the 90s. But that involved using you know, graphics card and cards in different graphics modes. And there were certain graphics modes where there was memory space that was not shown that you could essentially load into. I found out later, this is exactly what the folks who programmed Doom and those other games were doing. So it must have been bouncing around some like message boards or something. And my neighbor was hot to that. He knew what was going on. <laughs> so he demoed this to me one day. I was just amazed. I was like, I can't believe it. It was so smooth. And it was, you know, just opened up so many more possibilities. But it required that he break into, you know, via QBasic, you can do some low-level calls, peek and poke kind of things that were very intentional and very well-informed. But then we kind of realized that wasn't going to go too far or it would be difficult to do that. And that's when C actually introduced C. And obviously from there, I was like, I got to learn this. And I'd been doing that ever since. And well, not C so much. Obviously, nowadays, C is not, not the top language, but Python instead. I wouldn't say it's my favorite language either. To be honest with you, I'm not even a big fan of Python. <laughs> I'm much more fond of things like Lisp, um, Scheme, those kind of languages. But, you know, not as popular for this kind of work right now. Yeah. By the way, we haven't mentioned this. I don't know when we would, except for now. But I also work in a project called Hi, H-Y. Essentially, it's a version of Lisp. It's kind of like the closure of Python. Closure is a JVM compiled language. It's actually written in Java. And um, Hi is essentially a variant of Lisp that is compiled to Python bytecode. Actually, technically to Python AST, which uh, makes for a little more possibility than just you know, directly to bytecode. So check that out if anyone's interested. It's fully compatible 
meaning you can import, load any Python libraries that you want. doesn't matter. Everything is compatible. That is, you know, standard Python type of code. But it also has macros in the general sense of list macros. Not hygienic macros, nothing fancy like that, like in Racket and all. But it's there and it's fun. I recommend it. Yeah. We'll put that in the show notes for people who, who want to take it out. Let's do that. And now let's go to the symbolic computation part and to the Bayesian statistics uh, part again. And you're going to tell us uh, what's the link between all that and what are static graphs and so on. <laughs> so I think something interesting would be to talk about symbolic PyMC, which is the project you're spearheading in the PyMC organization. So first, can you define relational programming and symbolic computation for listeners who don't know about them? Yes. I think the definition for relational programming, kind of like declarative programming or even functional programming, some people have strict definitions, very clear cut ones, but everyone argues about these. So mm. I'm just going to say relational for our purposes here. We just mm. mean relations, like, you know, the math variety of relations. The standard example is something like equality or equivalence, an equivalence relation. Something that is kind of two sides, in a sense. You're saying, you know, X is equal to Y and Y is equal to X. They both reflect the like property, whatnot. Now, in this scenario, for symbolic pi and C and the kind of stuff I'm trying to set up, Relational is also more like taking identities from mathematics. You know, it could be identities between distributions. Like, you know that the sum of two normal distributions is also normal. Again, that's an equality of sorts. And the equality goes both directions. You could take a normal distribution and break it up into the sum of two normal distributions, right? And you could do the opposite. You could take the sum of two normal distributions and turn that into a single normal distribution. Yeah. So a lot of things work this way. Um, a lot of identities that we use when defining models or, you know, manipulating models. And that's why I care about relational programming. A lot of manipulations we might want to do on a model usually only involve one of those directions, right? It would be usually collapsing the sum of two normals into just a single normal. But there are definitely scenarios where the, the opposite side of that equality, the opposite direction is important. And with relational programming, you're kind of forcing yourself to define things in a way that works, again, both directions. You can do it in a way that builds up nicely what I'm saying is you can have a core set of relational operations. And if you write most of your code using that core set of relational operations, the result will tend to be relational. <laughs> like it'll tend to have that property. So in that sense, it's not like you have to think about, oh, I'm going to have to program both directions. I'm going to have to say, if something, then, you know, expand into two normals. Or if something else, collapse two normals into one normal. It's not really like that. It doesn't have to be like that. But anyway, a lot of the relational programming I'm talking about is also pretty well encapsulated by essentially calling it something like prolog. Essentially, if you have an understanding of prolog, that explains everything. I'm not saying I would ever use prolog <laughs> to do this stuff. Instead, I've chosen a different relational programming language. It's actually a domain-specific language, an embedded language in Python that, that can be implemented in Python. It's called mini Canron which I'll say, uh, in a sense, I was introduced to by um, Matt Rocklin, who I imagine you're familiar with. Yeah. In a way, his work kind of set me on this path with Mini Canron, in Python at least. And yeah, it fits very well for a lot of this. And again, if anyone's not familiar with Prolog, this is a kind of language where, again, in a declarative sense, I guess is perhaps a better way to put this, is you state what you want, the kind of outcome that you want. You don't necessarily have to dig into the details of how it's done, like, how the actual loop is performed, et cetera. In these sorts of contexts, you have to build things up. You have to write things with relational operators in order to get these results. One other way to look at it is it's almost like you can automatically solve for things. Algebra is a great example. With relational programming and, you know, especially with the example of Prolog, you can easily define things that like find elements of a very specific variety, you know, by stating what their properties are or aren't, things like that. So there are strong relations to overload the word <laughs> between like a lot of things that developers are interested in regarding type theory, you know, like a lot of folks who are into ML and Haskell and those kind of things. But there are some connections, like for instance, a uh, mini Canon, I guess, is often used to prototype certain like type theories. You can write a relational interpreter, for instance. And that is to say, you can loosely define the kind of program that you want based on what it does, right? It prints messages of this variety or you know, something of that nature. 
Quines are a good example. You can basically use a relational interpreter to generate programs, to do program synthesis. It'll spit out code that performs the operation that you, you know, defined or specified in a certain way. Okay, so this means that if I understood correctly, this type of relations and symbolic computations, basically, do you have to declare all the rules that you were talking about? Like, for instance, the mathematical rules with the probability distribution, you know, when I add these distributions, then it becomes that, or maybe also the conjugate priors, etc. Do you have to declare all that in your code? And then once you have that, it speeds things up quite a lot because then you can take advantage of all these algebraic and mathematical relations between the variables and the distributions and you don't have to simulate, always simulate. You can be more targeted and more precise in what you do if I understood correctly, right? Yeah, there are many aspects of this that still need to be really worked out, but I would say that the basic idea is in this relational context, I'm using relational programming to do this symbolic computation. Mm -hmm. The relational part gives you a platform to define a bunch of identities, like you said, you know, conjugate identities, just general distributional relationships, things like that. Essentially, theorems, more or less, of a certain variety. Some, you know, they can often be inequalities. All of these are amenable to this sort of symbolic programming in, in a relational context. So it gives you a platform to write those all out without having to do it with the express intention of it being used for any very specific thing. It just says, here's how normal distributions and their sums are related. That's mm -hmm. it. And from there, the operations that one would want to do, some, for instance, are simplification. And this is something you'd see in a symbolic algebra context, for instance. Give me a model and I'm going to simplify it. By simplify, it means something specific. You're going to have to give it a measure of what is simple or more simple or not, some sort of objective like that. So one part of this is just to build a collection and knowledge base of programmatically defined and usable. That's the important part. There's a difference between just like having like your grad Steinman book of table of integrals and the ability to actually use it, like for instance, Mathematica or Maple or something would give you. But what we want for Symbolic Pi MC and just our community of probabilistic programming folks, the ability to share those, build them up, and reuse them. You've got libraries like Scikit-Learn and uh, these other huge collections of models. And, you know, a lot of them are sometimes just slight modifications of other models that are already written. And sometimes via simply object-oriented programming, class structure, API, you can kind of reuse certain elements. You know, you can reuse the notion of like taking the gradient of, of an objective function and then looping a fixed point operation until you reach a minimum or something. Like some pieces of code can be reused like that with plug and play, like, oh, just plug in the objective function, plug in the tolerance for when you reach the fixed point. And then that can be used by a bunch of different estimation procedures for different models. But I'm looking at this a little differently and trying to cover more ground, the math parts of things that we reuse often as well as just not to, for reuse, but to apply them pretty universally. Like all the numerical tricks people do, like the log scale manipulations, you know, log sum exponent, these kind of things. These are almost pretty straightforward mathematical identities. And in a lot of cases, it's not too hard to say that we should apply these when we see them. I mean, not always, but still. Where I see the issue being with that kind of thing is sometimes that, you know, it's not just that you need a log sum exponent function, but maybe the log sum exponent function is just a product, a derivation from a, another simple identity. And you don't want every variation of that. You don't want a gigantic library with a bunch of log something functions, right? Instead, it would be better to use basic principles when possible to have derived those. And especially in scenarios where cumulative use of more than a couple of those special log functions can be simplified, right? Like that's another thing is if you really do look at a lot of what we do in a big picture, global sense, we miss out on a lot of optimizations that can mean a lot performance wise, you know, numerical accuracy, but then also just the notion of how easy is it to define and implement a model? Like it, it can be pretty tough because you'll run into these little issues if you didn't see them all, you know, when you started, yet they could be automated. So just like with any programming language, it has a compiler that tries to make it easier for the developer so that they don't have to focus on is this contiguous memory and this or that, which operation should I use? Yes, that's super interesting. So if I understood correctly, I see at least 
the benefits of doing that and implementing symbolic computation as you explained it, which would be one, it can make your models run faster and so on because you rely on these algebraic and mathematical relationships so you don't have to always simulate. So this speeds things up. And two, it's easier to understand and to maintain for the developers because then your code can be more concise and more neatly structured, I'd say. And three, it can also be easier to understand and to implement for users because what I'm thinking when I hear that is, well, maybe we can use these tools to implement automatic reparameterization, for instance, of models, instead of having to try out and code explicitly like the centered version and the non-centered version, for instance, to just take one reparameterization. Well, then you could just have your model, like the graph of your model, and then the reparameterization would be automatically done by the software and it would choose the best one between the different ones. How am I wrong here? <laughs> no, that's that's basically it. I, I would, you know, cautious as to say that, you know, this kind of work, uh, it doesn't get rid of any problem. I would say what, well, it does, but, you know, there's a conservation of effort. A law of conservation of effort mean the required effort goes away. It just means it goes somewhere else. But that's still very important. I guess a lot of what I'm talking about, and again, to go back to the relational and declarative programming, these paradigms, is more about organization, right? It's more about how we look at the problems we're dealing with. How do we scale them? You have to organize things in order to go far with them. And you definitely have to organize things in order to automate them. And a big part of what we're talking about here is simply automation. So yeah, like you want a great user experience for your PPL, then it should be possible to define a naive version of a model that's not reparameterized or that needs to be reparameterized. You know, one like that, the Niels funnel kind of thing, Yeah, a classic example. Mm. Like I should be able to define a model that, you know, is not really possible to estimate directly as defined, right? Because this just goes back to kind of basic notions in computer science for programming languages, the development of programming languages and their purpose, more or less. So yeah, it's that kind of a thing, but you definitely have to organize your work. You have to encode the relations, again, mm. in the math sense, the things that you're using that drive your operations. And if you can encode, encode them a little more generally, that really helps, right? Especially so you don't have to keep rewriting things. And, and also so that you can focus, you know, testing very specific implementations so things become a little more bulletproof. And you can look at this and say, all right, Mathematica already exists. You can do a lot of symbolic algebra. SymPy already exists, all that. But, you know, these are things that unfortunately don't have strong connections to a lot of the current software people are using, right? Connections between SymPy and, you know, Fiano or TensorFlow are more or less non-existent. Yeah. And even though you can do a lot of the same stuff in SymPy, but even then, you know, the simplifications that it provides, those are pretty specific to certain algebraic requirements or interests and not so much to, you know, modeling ones, or especially modeling if it's being done via MCMC, you know, there are definitely different types of model reformulations that are kind of only relevant for doing certain sampling, you know, sampling of a certain variety. Or, you know, again, it's like these identities that I'm describing that need to be encoded, need to be programmed. They don't exist in those libraries. You know, like Mathematica has some pretty good support for probability distributions, probability theory. You know, if you sum normals in Mathematica, you'll get, you know, a single normal back. And it has those. But if you ever really try to use them, you'll find that there's still just as much work. You still have to write a lot of code that rewrites those, that uses those identities. Yeah. And then we're just right back to like, okay, how easy is it to write code in those languages and mm -hmm. in those platforms? How much of the extra framework aspects do you have to deal with that are otherwise not immediately relevant? And there are, tend to be quite a bit. So what I've been shooting for is something lighter weight that can sit on top of these libraries. Again, this is where I'd say Matt Rockland made a pretty good argument for a lot of this in the context of Fiano a while back. And yeah, this is still true today. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. As well as the fact that just to do symbolic manipulation, like for instance, PyMC, I want to get some of the samplers. We, we write a lot of custom samplers in the papers that we publish. And how could I get those to work in PyMC? So I could write a step method that allows one of these custom sampling methods to work. So for instance, for a horseshoe, a custom sampler for a horseshoe or, or the horseshoe plus that we wrote. Mm. 
But then a person would have to know to use that, right? They'd have to know that their model, that what they've defined is a horseshoe prior or is a horseshoe plus prior or some other extension. And then they'd also have to say, I want to use that very specific step method to sample for this. And now where I am with that thinking is very few people are going to do that, especially because unless you've designed your model with the express intention that this is going to have a horseshoe prior or horseshoe plus prior that can be sampled independently from, you know, these other parts of the model in this particular way. Um, Unless you can do all that and want to spend the time doing it, it needs to be automated. I need to be able to define a model that is a hierarchical, but is effectively a horseshoe prior or something like that. And then have that be noticed and identified as a horseshoe prior and then have this sampler applied. Mm. That's the only way it would really be useful other than in very narrow situations. And that kind of manipulation alone, again, it would be overkill to use Simpy, extreme overkill, even more so to use Mathematica and many other libraries. So that's a missing piece. <laughs> that's, that's where symbolic PyMC is trying to, again, demo. It's not really trying to be the answer to anything. It's just trying to demo a lot of these things. Yeah, I think related to that, I found a very interesting sentence on one of your articles on your blog, which helped me actually understand better the goals and the meaning of symbolic computation. And this sentence is, instead of the common efforts to independently implement each model and method, followed by their placement in an API, implementations can be encoded in and organized by the very mathematics from which they were derived. So I think it really echoes what we're talking about since the beginning of the show. Yeah, you can also picture a lot of this, especially when you connect it to things like Prolog. This is what people consider the classic AI, right? The whole AI lab, MIT lab, where scheme and uh, list type things were popular. Or even, yeah, list itself kind of, I guess, motivated by doing symbolic programming of this type. That was to automate, and in part, specifically to automate math, aspects of it, at least, algebra. You look in the classic, what's it called? Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, the book. And one of the basic examples in there is symbolic differentiation, right? It's a simple example in there. This is not like a huge thing they had to write out. But you'll notice now with like tensor libraries and all that, that that's kind of the main, (laughs) I mean, obviously automatic differentiation, which people love to think is is something so different, but it's not. Again, the general notion is symbolically manipulating computational graphs. Yeah, what we're talking about uh, since the beginning is, I'm aware of that uh, quite heavy stuff for our listeners, and I guess it's hard to follow everything along only by audio, but I put a lot of resources in the show notes to your articles about that because there are some enlightening stuff, and maybe to try and be more concrete now that we understood, I think the high-level concepts is... I'm wondering what would be the ideal realization of symbolic PMC? You know, would it be like stuff like automatic reparameterizations, as we talked uh, about before? And actually, you have an example of that on the Raiden model on your website. So I'll link to that in the show notes. And it's true that from my point of view, where I'm a user of libraries, thinking about having automatically reparameterized models is really awesome. And we talked about that already with Maria Gorinova in episode 17. She works a lot on that too and for the stand side of things. But I think in the future, if we can have that, that's really super interesting and really a game changer. So I'm wondering about what you think about that and what do you envision in an ideal world stuff that Symbolink PyMC could bring to the table? Yeah, Symbolic Primacy is more of a showcase. It's a platform for a set of tools, which have already branched off into completely different libraries. There's this whole pythological thing I set up that, you know, is re-implemented or even newly implemented, certain list-like, again, very basic notions of S expressions and other things that if you look to the literature of symbolic programming, you'll find these notions all over, term rewriting and these kind of things. Again, this is really old stuff. This is not new in any way. Even the idea of automatic reparameterization, these kind of things, aren't new. And there have been a lot of people talking about them for decades. 
<laughs> so the real thing that needs to be done, though, is to find a, a good context for them, yeah. to find developers to do the work. And again, we're speaking here very specifically about probability theory, measure theory, the type of math that underlies our concerns as modelers, Bayesian especially. And that's a niche. It's not a niche that is so new as to require new things, but it is a niche that does require its own type of work, like you know, specific types of identities and for them to be used in specific ways. But the mechanics, it's the groundwork that needs to be done. And in Python, obviously, that's the thing. Like I said before, I'm not a big fan of Python as a language. It's just what everyone's using and it's what the people that do my kind of work are fond of. So you got to work with what you got. And I'm trying to make it a little easier to do this kind of symbolic work in Python. So yeah, symbolic PyMC, we did reparameterization and all that, which again, were just very basic, very straightforward things to do in the world of symbolic programming. I think my first blog post on this, which did automatic collapsing of normal random variables and such, was done in pure Theano. It used Theano's optimization framework, and you could just use regular old Python to manipulate the graphs. But the thing that it didn't have was it didn't provide a context that was friendly or scalable for adding a bunch of identities like that. You weren't encoding the identity, the relation. You were just doing these steps to perform, to get one side of the relation. That's a huge distinction. And what I'm saying is it's not scalable. So I definitely look at a lot of work about you know automatic reparameterization, these kind of things, with a lot of scrutiny, because I'm basically saying you can do that. You could always have done that. What matters is how you do it, how extensible it is, how it looks, how it reads. These are important. And one is because who knows the identity? Who knows which identities to use? Well, it's a different group of people, right? Like the people I write papers with, they're usually the ones that work with these identities all the time and they think about them in certain ways. And I'm trying to reach them a lot of the time. Like I'm trying to reach my mentor, Nick Polson and those folks, right? Like I'm trying to tell them like, you can do this. You can write these theorems that we've proven and such programmatically and have them applied automatically. Like, I want that to be the case. And that's a totally different objective from just the general notion of can we reparameterize automatically, things like that. So there's a sort of outreach to that, which unfortunately I'm not the best at going out to conferences and getting people hyped up about things. The best I could do is what I've done, and that's create a repository where I've demoed some of this. When I got people thinking about it, I hope that's what comes out of this podcast as well. I'm not saying that mini Canrin is the best way to do it, but I definitely want people to think about relational programming, you know, declarative, and things like that. Basically, get the implementation details away from the objectives and the way it's thought about at a higher level. If only to get people who think at that level professionally more involved, to give them a place to become involved. Again, it's a huge amount of work. And I do think it'll, if this kind of work becomes the norm, it would start in a context like this. It would start in the open source Python world where, you know, the developers of a library like PyMC have kind of hit these boundaries, right? They've noticed that, you know, we're constantly telling people, like in Stan, you look at the Stan forums, message boards or whatnot. It's like, I would say one of the biggest benefits or power that Stan has, it's just this community people who are helping each other reformulate models to work around these kind of things yeah. but they're already on the path of automation they're, you know they're already interested in that but i feel that it has to be a little more accessible i think the pure python approach is a huge component to that right like you have to imagine take a person who proves theorems who does work at that level mathematical statistics level they're going to know which things to apply best to say or to assess in order to say should we apply this transform or whatever right? For certain things, maybe not for numerical stability, but maybe for other reasons. Regardless, do you really want them, you know, writing things in C++ like they might have to if they're using TensorFlow or something, right? Like you want those graph manipulation things to be accessible, interactive. Again, all the benefits of Python, the reasons why beginners come to Python, right? It's accessible. So these kind of things, it's tough. <laughs> and again, there's a lot of really old school stuff that people need to maybe start getting into in order to do this kind of work, but it's all there. I think that's a really honorable goal. I really love these ideas. I want to talk uh, about your most recent blog post about dynamic linear models or DLMs of their poetic name. But first, even though we're getting short on time, but I want to ask you this quite concrete question on symbolic computation, this last one. 
which would be in which cases or which models do you think symbolic computation is particularly appropriate? And conversely, in which cases you think symbolic approach is not particularly useful? Yeah, that's a vital question because, for instance, don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating full and complete automation. I'm really advocating the tools to automate specific things, right? For instance, when to apply a certain sampler, that can be automated. But to say that we want to automate the application of every sampler or something like that, that's a different story. And I'm going to say that, for instance, again, you have to go high level to think about this. You have to say, which category of objective or thing am I trying to accomplish? If it's numerical stability, then yeah, a product of a lot of very small probabilities or something that you're going to want to rescale or something like that. We're doing this already a lot in PIMC and all the other PPLs where it does certain log transforms, and things like that, softmax and these kind of things. So there are those cases where people are already doing automatic transformations. They're just not really doing it so automatically. They're kind of just doing it, what I would say is locally, it's like always applying this transform given this input. Now, that tends to work for a lot of cases, but there are definitely cases where a global assessment of the model would be more appropriate. And that's where I think these automations start to really kick in, where regress manipulation as a whole starts to be a thing. As far as like complexity and the time it takes to draw samples and things of that nature, I can imagine where we would have model reformulations that take a bunch of independently sampled, say it a whole bunch of independent normals that were manipulated in a bunch of different ways, but ultimately could be sampled in a block, right? So just small efficiencies like that. One example that I think I've mentioned before in some of our issues in PyMC is indexing. Let's say you have a multivariate normal with the size of a million and a diagonal matrix. So it's essentially about a million independent normals or even not with a diagonal matrix, covariance matrix. But let's say you then index and pull out only the first element in that vector. Okay, should you sample a million normal random variables and then pull out the first one? No, absolutely not. That's a simple manipulation to a graph. That's a simple thing you can do already. Again, you could do it in Theano. You could technically do it in TensorFlow. But this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Like, I need the ability to apply something that lifts the index operation into the arguments of the million-long multivariate normal or something that just says that because I indexed, it's really just a single normal random variable. So things like that. And over time, as more PPLs are developed and we see these kind of things, we're going to run into more and more. It's a patchwork. That's where, how I see it being used. Again, not shooting for a system that will take all the identities you can think of and apply them appropriately. <laughs> that's not realistic. Okay, so that's for the good sides, the advantages. But when would you not use uh, symbolic computation? When would you think? In my mind, I would think that symbolic computation, there is one case where you would say, oh no, it's useless. But I think there are most cases where you don't use it is, yeah, you could use it, but it's an overkill in that case. I would say that my prior is that often when you don't use it, it's because it's an overkill, not because it wouldn't work. But what do you think about that? One example is just the notion of simplification. If you were to add a huge library of identities, you know, a bunch of different ways you can manipulate models. I think a classic example of when this breaks down is with a huge library of identities to transform a model and maybe even a well-defined simplification objective or something, measure of simplification. It could take forever to simplify certain models, right? Just to loop through all the possible identities, just the generic efficiency of doing that. These are things that, you know, if you run Mathematica, it's pretty easy to put in an integral that it can't solve in under a minute or something, or even at all. So again, all the same limitations exist in what I'm talking about that I do in regular symbolic algebra and symbolic math. But as anyone who uses those sorts of tools regularly, you approach it like a programmer, like a developer. You debug it, you profile it, you find out what it's doing, you find it out, you find out you needed to redefine this thing or restrict which identities were being considered. And my answer is kind of that you wouldn't want to throw the kitchen sink at of symbolic manipulations at just everything or generic models, etc. There's definitely a sophistication that goes into when you use these in combination with each other. And thus, yes, what I'm saying is also, you could look at it as you would never you know, completely base something like Pi and C off of these automations. They would always be just another tool to be used at certain steps very judiciously. 
And obviously, you can make improvements to the big picture, the one, the kitchen sink picture of, you know, try every identity and get the absolute best model. But that's a different level of work. And different people work on that, right? That's a very standard computer science kind of endeavor. And all I'm saying with this stuff is we want to bridge that gap. We want those people do to be feeding in directly via the tools we're using. And again, that's why I like the mini camera and stuff. They're working on a lot of things like that, how to efficiently and quickly apply a bunch of relations, you know, things like that. I just want to be able to reuse that work immediately because I'm working in that context too, but for a different purpose. That makes sense. Okay, so I could ask you other questions about that because it's super interesting and I have a lot to learn about that. But let's switch gears and take a concrete example now because you recently wrote a very interesting article about implementing dynamic linear models in Fiano. I think this was motivated by work on modeling COVID-19 cases. In part, yes. <laughs> yeah, in part, yeah. First, can you tell us what DLMs are, when they are useful, and why symbolic computation is helpful there? Yeah, so DLMs or dynamic linear models are, are kind of just the Bayesian way of looking at Kalman filters or state space models. Tend to focus around an observation equation that's usually just normal distributed error in the linear term, but the linear term also has an under hidden state that it relies on. And that's also usually has a normal errors. Okay. These are all with just linear terms. So it's a hierarchical kind of linear model, which in the Bayes world itself is pretty well studied and, you know, easy to manipulate. It just so happens that in this context, just like with common filters, you can cover a whole lot of ground, regression, ARIMA models, like all. And then as in the Bayes world, hierarchical extensions are very easy to define and in certain ways to understand. So you can change those normal errors to something a little more exotic. And in the post, that's actually more the purpose of the post, was to show how you could use the polygamma extension. So what I mean by that is a good way to look at things in the Bayes world or just in statistics world is as being conditionally simple, conditionally linear. That means you've conditioned on certain terms. And then when you do that, they happen to be linear. They happen to be normally distributed or something. Scale mixture distributions, which are types of manipulations we use a lot in the published work, are great examples, and that's one of the examples I did. So I extend the simple normal errors to non-normal to be you know, negative binomial, which again is a huge shift from the continuous time series to discrete. And all it required was a scale mixture. And then I showed how you can take the entire framework of DLMs and their Bayesian estimates, that is a forward filter backward sample, it's a pretty standard, you know, Bayes time series, the MCMC approach to estimating those. And how you could still use that, make some kind of minor changes, and all of a sudden you've got negative binomial response. And the other aspect of this, again, this is all pretty well-known stuff. So nothing about this is new. But the other aspect I wanted to point out was how straightforward it can be to define this in a symbolic setting and how easy it is to then extend it to these other cases. With time series, especially, if you have a symbolic for loop like scan in Theano, TensorFlow has similar operations, it's a little more natural. It looks a little more, it feels a little more like the math. That to me is really important. This goes back to PPLs and making them useful, right? And time series are a huge gap in that world. Yeah. yeah. In a lot of cases, in most PPLs, they're usually something to complain about with regard to time series. So I was just kind of showing that, and I had to use some of the stuff from Symbolic PyMC, where I've made a much more intuitive, easier to use operators for random variables, which made all this possible in the first place, or easier to define, and also easier to manipulate. But unfortunately, I didn't get to all the like symbolic manipulation, and I just did things by hand. And also, I used that to illustrate certain reformulations. Like I showed out there's a standard column and filter equations. There's smooth forward filtering, the standard stuff. Uh, we can get closed form posteriors. But then there's also a smoothing where you go back and they're also closed form. But if you implement them the way you would write them in math, so to say, in linear algebra, it's not going to work well. Singular matrices are very sensitive matrices here that it just won't work. And there's a common trick to um, use square root filters. It helps you keep the positive definiteness or non-negative definiteness and not even definite necessarily of these covariance matrices by using their singular value decomposition, which is exactly what I did in this case. But one of the reasons I was even illustrating all this 
was with the intent of showing how you can do these tricks automatically. You can automate them. It's going to require a little more, like you have to start tagging matrices as covariant matrices. Well, in some cases, you don't need to. If it's a covariant matrix that came out of a random variable operator, you know, as an argument to a random variable operator, then you can more or less assume it's supposed to be positive definite or something like that. But there are other cases where you might have to do a little more. So as a follow-up to this, I might go through all that and show how you could automate the application of these little tricks, SVD tricks. And again, what would that give you? That would allow you to define the models naively, right? Go ahead, you know, use the inverse, use Q inverse, right? We'll take care of the rest. We'll make it so that you don't have to do all this rewriting. And of course, there's also the added advantage that you can have unit tests for the rewrites and the thing that they rewrite to. And thus, you can feel at least a little better instead of every time you have to do one of these models, you know, you just want to be sure you, you got the algebra right. Yeah, this is a very interesting example. And again, it's going to be in the show notes uh, too, because it's quite a deep article. So we can't really exhaust all of the substance in the episodes, but it's very interesting. I would like to add though, is actually recently, the past couple of days, I finally got something set up where there is a bridge between these CNO random variable operators that I used in this example, such that you can automatically create high MC distributions out of the scan operators that are producing um, time series. If the scan operator outputs a random variable, then that is something you can make a distribution for. If you look at the implementations in the PyMC library for certain time series, basically automating the construction of those distribution classes by automatically computing the log likelihoods and implementing the log P that you would need to if you had made your own distribution. And the end effect of that is you could just define your time series like I did in the, these examples here and then you can automatically create a model object out of them and estimate specific quantities or all of it using a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or no U-turn sampler or whatever else PyMC offers. So that's the thing is in this example, I had to write all my own samplers, which happened to work out because I had a few in mind. But what if I've added a term in here that I can't think of a sampler for and I just want to throw Metropolis Hastings or something like that? At it? Well, now what I'm saying is this recent work, you can't you can do that. Yeah. Okay, super interesting. Before moving on, can you quickly define maybe for listeners, because we use two terms that may not be very well known, which are Kalman filters and scale meter. Can you maybe define those two quickly for listeners? So yeah, Kalman filters, a classic, again, state-space type of model. These are more like iteratively defined models. They're distributions. They usually have a Markov relationship. They depend on the last finite number of previously observed values. Basically, you add a time in index to your noise parameter or something like that. I think state-space model is the best way to put it, but common filters, I guess, just more general in that as far as history is concerned. They're not necessarily Bayesian. They live in a world that's much broader. It involves a lot of you know, tracking problems and People have done a lot to extend those. So it's a good bridge to bring in a lot of people who understand that world. And scale mixtures, in my mind, it exists in the world of kind of hierarchical extensions. Like, you know, you can have a normal random variable, and then you can say that its variance is distributed according to something, you know, inverse gamma or something like that. And then the product of those two, you know, gets you something like a T distribution or something else of that nature. Well, you can do that with all different combinations of distributions. And as a matter of fact, you can just focus on the sort of mixing distribution as being the normal, and then consider all the different distributions you could put on the variance term, or even the mean term. You know, any parameterization you want to give a normal distribution, consider what you would get if you made all of those parameters in that normal have distributions themselves. You'll find that there are so many other distributions that you get. So Really what this looks like is, if you remember the Laplace, or like there are different transforms, like the Fourier transform, Laplace transform. I think it, it, technically speaking, if you're interested in normal scale mixtures, where it's a normal with you know, its parameters having other distributions, inverse Laplace transform covers that world, right? Because like the, the transform part of it is still that sort of exponential squared term. So it's neat because it kind of means you can turn things into conditionally normal distributions, which again, as I mentioned, is a great way to simplify problems. If something being conditionally linear, for instance, in just regular old world of math it tends to be very convenient, but they can also be significantly more advanced. Like you can have non-normal scale mixtures. The polygamma that I used in that dynamic linear models post is, is one of those examples. 
the logistic distribution other ones can be decomposed. We have a few papers on this. We have one that was in Biometrica a while back called a Default Bayesian Analysis of Global Local Shrinkage Priors. Actually, almost all of our papers involve these scale mixtures to some extent. It's a world of like identities and manipulation that is extremely flexible. You'll find that a lot of work kind of breaks down to these very basic tricks. It's almost like defining a new basis for your problem. If you look, it also can relate a lot of machine learning algorithms and models to Bayesian ones. There are quite a few support vector machines and some other ones that, that don't generally seem to have that strong of a connection to probability theory base and all that. They really can. And sometimes it's through these scale mixtures. I see. Very interesting. Again, uh, we're going to refer the listener to your article about that because it's explained more in details. Quick question before asking you the last two questions. And it would be more of a forward thinking, to use a loaded term question, which would be, what does the future of probabilistic programming languages look like to you? And which advances are you particularly excited about? Yeah, obviously the symbolic side of it, but I would like to see a world where certain identities, concentration inequalities, things like that, high level math stuff right now, be turned into exceptionally more practical things. I would like to see us working on frameworks, general producing theorems that tell us what a better model reformulation for a particular sampling scheme would be. I really like the idea of like general universal frameworks, not ones that give you all the answers, but ones that at least compartmentalize the types of models that we look at and the properties that they have. I would like to see a lot of that being kind of the main focus of development. I think it would make it so that like, again, this gap between theoretical, quote unquote, theoretical is just minimized, if not gone those theorems and those things become immediately useful. It's a lot of work, obviously, but I think it just holds an it's a ridiculous amount of promise. Like I look at most of the models we use and I can think of uh, just so many ways that you can improve them. So many things we could try, but the effort is just enormous. It's overwhelming, right? I think, for instance, Bayesian work doesn't have to be slow, right? It doesn't have to be time consuming or anything like that. I think the problem, the reason it is because of the, these limitations, because we're not looking at things symbolically, we're not manipulating them that way, and we're not applying these identities that we could be. So yeah, I see that in the future. Yeah, well, that's good. That's a good future, I think. <laughs> Well, Ronan, we're already at the end of the show. I, uh, you're very generous with your time. So thank you very much about that. But before you go, I'm going to ask you the two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. So the first one is, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Well, I already answered that, I think. <laughs> it would definitely be this kind of stuff. Again, good framework for doing symbolic work the tools for doing it, and a lot of just good examples, a lot of good motivating examples, things that would reach people. Well, perfect. So the second question is, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? Ooh, wow, good question. These are tough. I mean, I can definitely think of a lot of people that I would like to, but most like to is the part that makes it difficult. I don't know. I guess it would always be interesting, of course, to talk to someone from way back when, like, I don't know, Archimedes or someone, just to see. I would like to gauge exactly how different the thinking or how adaptable someone from that far, right? Like you hear all these things about, what is it, that Antikythera device and these like things in ancient times that were very sophisticated and how we had kind of underestimated what people were thinking of. So for instance, the symbolic stuff, it would be wonderful to just pose that question to someone from you know, ancient times and see if they would grasp that immediately. I, I kind of have a feeling it probably would, right? No, plus you could go have dinner in Greece. So it's always nice, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that could be nice too. Yeah, yeah. You can do that now, but... <laughs> yeah, that's true. But it would be, you know, two birds, one stone, so... Yeah, plus what would the cuisine be like back in the time before tomatoes, right? The Mediterranean without tomatoes. That would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. <laughs> well, Brendan, thank you for taking the time. I learned so much about symbolic computation and relational programming. I hope we gave listeners the idea to try out this stuff on their own with symbolic piancy, for instance. I wish you good luck on this project and thank you for all the open source work you do. 
As usual, I'll put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Brendan, for taking the time and being on this show. Thanks for having me. You bet. Thanks. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn base stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good base and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good base. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation.